Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? Good. Um, my name is Joel Derbyas. Um, I'm a Hindu priest, a uh, contract programmer, and a sysadmin, most various things that I do. And uh, I uh, live in the USA with my wife and two children. And I recently, in January, January uh, celebrated my eighth anniversary as a Debian developer. And I got involved with uh, Debian and Linux uh, way back in the very early days of the commercial internet when I worked for one of the first internet providers in the, in the USA, the first one that would uh, provide service to the general public. And I became interested in how the internet worked. And uh, it was pretty much uh, everything in those days ran on Unix. But Unix meant a big, expensive box from like Sun or Digital or you know, some company. Something that I, you know, as a struggling, lowly tech, couldn't afford. But then I heard from one of my colleagues that there was this new operating system that worked just like Unix, called uh, Linux. And if you had three or four boxes of floppy disks, you could download it, you could install it on your PC, and uh, make as many copies of it as you want. And it had all the source code, so you could tinker with it as much as you like. And um, so that's something that, uh, uh, that would seem very appealing to me. So I started uh, playing around with Linux, uh, the, the, with Linux. The first variety of Linux I used was Slackware, which was working for me for a while until one day when in the course of a major upgrade that was going on at the time, I managed to completely uh, render my system non-functioning. So at that time, I started thinking that, well, seeing as I have to reinstall anyway, uh, let me see what else is out there. And uh, by that time, uh, Red Hat was in existence. It was uh, 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 in its fledgling stages. Uh, there were a couple of other uh, distributions around. Uh, but there's one that intrigued me, uh, to be honest, more for the name than anything else, because it sounded very science fiction-y to me for some reason. Uh, called Debian, so I decided to uh, install that. Uh, but things weren't quite working, uh, you know, the way I wanted them to. And uh, at one point, I was on the Debian uh, users mailing list. I was complaining about something or, or the other. And the Debian project leader at the time, Bruce Parents, uh, said to me that, like, instead of just whining, why don't you try and fix it? And I uh, said that, uh, you know, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll try that. And the reason I'm telling you this story is to illustrate uh, what I call the three pillars of Debian. Uh, community, technical excellence, and freedom. And uh, the community aspect is that Debian is not something which is just given to you from on high. It's something you're expected to get involved with, which you can change to your heart's content. If you like it exactly the way it is, that's fine too. But if there's things that you don't like, you don't have to wait for anyone's permission, or you don't have to you know, go through any complicated bureaucratic procedure in order to start changing things. You can uh, you know, do whatever you like. And then when, uh, you know, if it's something that other people might be interested in, you can also contribute it back into the system. And the technical aspect is, you know, Debian is very interested in being the best operating system there is. And we won't stand on ceremony. We won't have that not invented here at, uh, kind of attitude that some people have. If there's a good idea, if there's uh, you know, some uh, kind of uh, new feature that you know, would be a good addition to the system and that uh, you know, people might be interested in, uh, we'd be glad to uh, include it in the system. And the third, uh, the third pillar is freedom. Debian uh, was, for me, this was a very you know, novel experience to have such a powerful, you know, server class uh, operating system, 
which you can do anything you like with. And, and like I said, I was interested in figuring out how the internet worked. And, and you know, in those days we had, uh, you know, uh, not even 56K, it was like 28.8 modems uh, that people had. And so it was very difficult to be able to set up your own uh, little network uh, and, and test things out that, uh, that way. And even the networks that, that were there were you know, mostly used by businesses and so on. Or they were you know, very costly because the uh, internet providers were charged by the hour. So they were not really in the kind of uh, uh, environment where you, know, you could just uh, mess about with things. But thanks to Debian and thanks to Linux, uh, you know, I had, uh, uh, you know, full access to everything. So that's what impressed me, uh, and that's what convinced me that I should continue, uh, you know, exploring the system and contributing back to the system. So like I said, now it's been uh, eight years I've been uh, using uh, and uh, contributing to and um, advocating uh, Debian. And uh, I, I Honestly, at this point, can't think of uh, anything else I'd rather use. So how did Debian come about? Well, this part I'm sure everyone knows. Local boy, uh, Linus Torvalds, uh, decides to uh, do the same kind of tinkering, but on an even more basic level. And he uh, you know, builds an operating system kernel which at that time, uh, most people regarded as something that could only be done by experts and with uh, a whole lot of uh, time and money and manpower. But uh, he, he did it. And uh, he made two uh, crucial decisions uh, which uh, really caused his, his, first it was a toy, but you know, it caused his uh, toy to become you know, a powerful force in the computing world. And the first one of those was he decided to make his work available over the internet so that people, you know, outside of Finland, uh, you know, outside of his small circle of friends could, uh, um, could also contribute and could also make their uh, own changes and uh, make things work the way they wanted. And uh, that caused a tremendous explosion of interest very early on. And so he got a lot of very good help from other experienced people as well. So that, that, made, uh, that, that, that made the progress of Linux uh, uh, accelerate much faster. <coughs> and the second crucial decision he made, and maybe at that time even he may not have realized the consequences of it, but I think uh, uh, you know, the world should be glad that he did was he decided to put his uh, uh, invention under the new public license. That ensured that uh, not only would, it, would the version that he actually wrote be free, uh, but it would remain free for all time. And uh, you know, there were no worries that uh, it could be co-opted by you know, some company or line. Linus could decide that, well, I'm not interested anymore and uh, uh, just, uh, you know, decide to just end the project and, and bury it. So, um, very soon, other people started uh, playing around with this new operating system. They combined it with other uh, utilities that had been developed by the GNU project. Uh, Richard Stallman was a uh, computer scientist at MIT in the US. And he was very concerned about the way the computing industry was going. It seemed that it was becoming more and more commercialized. And that in itself would not have been bad, but the companies who were uh, you know, making all these commercial products were not interested in sharing information amongst each other. And I think the last straw came for him when uh, he had a, uh, in those days, very expensive and very brand new laser printers and he was trying to get it to work, but the driver uh, for, for the laser printer provided by the manufacturer wasn't really working very well. And they wouldn't tell him uh, you know, uh, what he needed to know to be able to fix it. And even then he managed to uh, get it fixed, but then they wouldn't let him share his changes with other people who had the same problem. 
So he started the Free Software Foundation. And the Free Software Foundation was uh, dedicated to uh, promoting the cause of software freedom. But one of the ways they were going to do that is to make a free operating system. And so they made all the components uh, that were needed for a Unix type operating system. Like, uh, usually uh, Unix programs are uh, created in the C uh, programming language. So they wrote a C compiler and they wrote a text editor and they wrote some games and all the basic things you would expect in, in an operating system. But one thing that they didn't have was the kernel, which is the actual heart of the operating system that controls everything else. So when uh, Linux came along, and it was also under the GNU license, it made a good fit. So many people started combining GNU utilities and the Linux kernel, and uh, made you know, what I refer to as distributions. Uh, so instead of having to gather all the bits yourself, uh, you could go to one central place and get everything. Like I said, first it was on floppy disks or magnetic tapes, and now it's CDs and DVDs and so on. So the first uh, distros, uh, as they were called, appeared on the scene. Uh, but they had one thing in common, as far as some people were concerned, that they were all not very good. <laughs> so, another student, this time from uh, Indiana in the US, called Ian Murdoch, decided that I can do better than this. So he decided to start his own distribution, and he gave it the name uh, Debian, which comes from, his wife's name was Deborah, so Deb Ian. So it has actually no science fiction kind of connotations whatsoever. This is from the name of him and his wife. Uh, but from the very beginning, uh, he decided to stress community, technical excellence, and freedom. Uh, because other distributions that were arriving on the scene at that time were, like for instance, Slackware was very popular, and it still has its uh, fans today. But it's basically the work of uh, one man. I think he has a couple of people helping him, but it's basically a one-man show. And uh, other distributions like Red Hat or uh, Susan were run as commercial companies, meaning that they used the same uh, basic uh, you know, code as uh, other like Linux distributions. They did make it available freely, but they also charged money for certain products that they made. But uh, Ian decided that his project would uh, be a volunteer affair and it would involve anyone who was interested in joining. And it would try and keep to uh, you know, the ideals of the free software movement uh, and to the early days of Linux. So that's why I refer to Debian as uh, Linux in its purest form. So now uh, from that very humble beginning, uh, there are close to a thousand Debian developers, possibly even more, uh, if you count other contributors who are not full, uh, fully fledged uh, developers. And uh, as Brandon said, they come from every continent, uh, except Antarctica, uh, every religion and p political and philosoph philosophical point of view you can think of. Uh, some are students, uh, some are professionally employed as programmers, uh, a new and uh, welcome development is increasingly some of them are being uh, paid to work on Debian or related projects. Uh, but it's a wide range of uh, different uh, uh, you know, ways of life that they come from. And uh, some of them are even female, which is uh, actually kind of a, a novelty in the uh, IT world these days. You know, many people are concerned about uh, you know, IT being a very male-dominated field, but uh, there's a, uh, a sub-project going on within Debian called Debian Women, which is uh, just uh, you know people trying to encourage uh, uh, girls and women who might be interested in this kind of thing, but maybe dissuaded by uh, you know the whole uh, you know laddish atmosphere that uh, you often get. 
uh, to uh, participate. And, and their numbers are slowly growing as well. So, uh, you know, the, the, that's one of the efforts that's going on. Um, currently, most of the developers are concentrated in the industrialized nations, but we're also starting to see uh, more um, developers coming up from, from you know, the third world, from Africa, South Asia, Middle East. Uh, they face a lot of problems, though, because they tend to be isolated. They tend to have uh, not uh, as good, uh, you know, uh, communications facilities, like broadband uh, is very spotty in, in most places unless you happen to live in a big city. So they have a lot of obstacles, but uh, you know, an operating system like Linux makes a lot of sense for uh, you know, countries where you know, they have to economize and they can't uh, necessarily you know, uh, be enthralled to some you know, big corporation and work on their schedule. So um, there are also initiatives on the way to uh, you know, spread uh, Debian into those areas as well. And the other part of the community, just as important as the developers, are the users. And the users are also very diverse. Uh, Debian is used in um, major corporations. I think later today you'll be hearing uh, from uh, uh, a representative of Hewlett Packard who'll be uh, talking a bit about uh, Debian in the corporate world. It's used by uh, universities, of course, because it's very good for educational purposes. Many uh, developers are, you know, students or professors. Uh, governments are uh, adopting <coughs> Debian um, quite a bit. Uh, in Brazil, uh, as Brandon mentioned, uh, I think Vienna was uh, recently a, a city that committed to transferring all of its IT infrastructure from Windows to Linux, and specifically to the Debian variety. Of and ordinary citizens. I, I've been uh, doing talks like this for a while, and it's amazing the range of people uh, who are, are now, uh, you know, using Linux. It, it, it used to be just the very hardcore <laughs> hacker types, you know, the people who are very into computers and always on the bleeding edge of everything. But I've heard from housewives and uh, you know grandfathers and. Uh, uh, it's basically people from all walks of life. And users, uh, you know, they're not just consumers. They don't just take the Debian that's given to them and uh, you know, say thank you. They can also contribute in their own way. Uh, a big part of the contribution uh, a, a humble user can make is by reporting bugs, giving feedback on packages, um, as, as Brandon mentioned, we try to do everything out in the open. So, you know, if you're interested in some aspect of where Debian is going, and uh, you have uh, something you'd like to say about it, uh, we won't just, uh, you know, uh, reject you as not being one of the anointed elite or anything like that. You know, everyone gets to, to participate. And bug reporting is, is, is a very, uh, it, it may seem like a very trivial thing, but it, it's, it's a very uh, good way of, uh, you know, doing quality assurance on software. And I think that's why we have uh, such a reputation for high quality, is because we make it easy for people to report problems and, you know, we react to them and fix them very quickly. And uh, they also do things uh, like writing documentation or helping other users by, you know, uh, internet chat or on the mailing lists. We have a very busy mailing list for users. Uh, and in fact, some people find it too busy because it gets like a couple of hundred messages a day. But if you have a question, if you have a problem, you can often get an answer within a few minutes. And even though you know other you know commercial operations offer like paid tech support uh, or uh, you know things of that nature, we often provide you know just as high a level of uh, high high quality level of support you know strictly by volunteers by users working with other users. And uh, because of the users uh, and and because of their. Uh, uh, 
advocacy. Uh, we have a very good reputation, and in fact, Debian is considered the second or third most uh, popular uh, Linux distribution, depending on who you ask. Uh, one problem that we have is that usually the kind of people who collect these statistics do things like they, they count shipments of boxes to you know, electronic stores or whatever. And because Debian doesn't really have any you know, formal, there's no Debian box set, uh, even the CDs that we do provide are done by third parties. We make the CD image available, but we don't really sell the CDs or you know, there's uh, no you know, central like store or something where you can buy Debian. So it's very hard to gauge the uh, actual number of uh, uh, Debian users out there. But most people who study these things uh, would say that we're probably, you know, either number two or number three. And uh, the second pillar I mentioned was technical excellence. And uh, usually, uh, you know, when people think of Debian, and when they think of its uh, technical merits, the first thing they point to is the packaging system. Uh, from the beginning, uh, the source code to Linux programs has been made uh, available for anyone who can get it, but not everyone has the skill to, uh, or the time or the inclination to uh, get you know, random uh, programs from, from various places on the internet and build them themselves. So what we do is we do all the process of building uh, programs and we make them into software packages that you can easily uh, add or remove or get information about. And um, a package can uh, either be a, pro a whole, an entire program or in some cases uh, where it's uh, uh, a very uh, big program or there are parts which are optional, it will be split up into smaller packages so you can install it partially instead of having to have everything. And um, along with the packages, we have a policy manual which specifies how the packages are to be uh, built and how they are to interact with, uh, with, with other packages. So uh, a Debian system is very well integrated together and um, everything um, you know, basically just works. Like if you install a web server, you uh, install it and it will just start working. Of course, you may need to do further configuration later on to have it work exactly the way that you want it. But there's not too much, uh, you know, uh, you can get, st uh, basically I'm trying to say that you can get started very easily, you know, uh, at least on a basic level with most Debian packages. And again, users who are not, uh, you know, that technically inclined or are busy with uh, other tasks, you know, they, they really appreciate that. And also, what helps there is the volunteer nature of Debian. Uh, because we don't have the commercial pressure to have uh, you know everything out in time for Christmas or, or something like that, we can take the time to solve a problem properly rather than coming up with a partial solution. And um, currently there are more than 10,000 packages in the Debian distribution. So uh, the uh, entire distribution takes up two DVDs now or about things like 17 CDs, it, it, it's, it's huge and has practically any kind of uh, 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 Linux software uh, that you could possibly want, as well as the uh, standard uh, uh, Unix type utilities like, uh, uh, you know, X Windows or, uh, uh, you know, the, the C compiler and so on. There's specialized packages for uh, uh, mapping or for uh, sequencing genes or for uh, uh, playing games, uh, different languages. Um, you know, so that also helps uh, users because they don't have to, you know, keep searching everywhere or compile the software themselves. 
And we actually improved that even one step further by a program called ACT. And uh, what that is, is a layer on top of the packaging system that um, installs packages uh, for you from the internet and, uh, and uh, make sure that you have all the extra uh, dependent packages needed to make it work um, so that you only have to type one command to get a particular package and everything you need to get it running will be installed for you. And now the other distributions are uh, catching up to us, but we were the first to have that capability. And I think we're still uh, the most highly regarded in that way. At any given time, there are actually three Debian distributions. Um, when uh, a developer such as myself makes a package, it goes into what's called our unstable distribution. Now, unstable is kind of a scary word because, you know, that kind of conveys, uh, you know, that everything is going to, you know, blow up any minute or, you know, something like that. But unstable just means constantly changing. Every day new packages are added as new versions come out or as bugs are fixed. And so the unstable distribution is uh, very dynamic. And some people like that. Some people like to be on the bleeding edge and get the very latest of everything. So th those are the kinds of users that uh, tend to run the unstable distribution. And the opposite of that is the stable distribution. And uh, the goal for the stable distribution is to be rock solid. So once we declare a distribution that's stable, we don't add any code to it after that, except for security fixes that may, may come up. And uh, as a result, uh, a, a new stable Debian distribution only comes out every uh, two or three years. So there's some talk about maybe uh, reducing that to uh, like about 18 to 24 months or so, or at least making the, 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 the cycle more predictable. But Currently, uh, it's about two to three years. And um, as a result, the software in the stable distribution isn't always the latest version. So the, the thrill seekers, the, the ones who uh, like to uh, have the latest of everything, they would find the stable distribution very boring. But there are many kinds of tasks where boring is what you want. Because if you're running a hospital, let's say, medical equipment, you just want it to keep working and keep working and keep working, and there'd be no strange surprises, no unexpected changes in the system. So for environments like that, or for a server, let's say, uh, the stable distribution is a good choice. And in between that, there is what's called the testing distribution. Uh, what we do is we uh, take packages from the unstable distribution that are in a good state, that haven't had any bugs report, any major bugs reported against them uh, lately, and we move them into this testing distribution. And this, it's the testing distribution when that's uh, bug free to our satisfaction and is in a you know good state overall. That becomes the new stable distribution, but. Many people also use it for, uh, you know, if they're kind of middle of the road types. You know, they, they don't want uh, absolutely new stuff, but they don't want very old stuff either. So it makes a good uh, medium kind of uh, range, uh, you know, between unstable and stable. Now these three distributions are also known by code names. Unstable is known as SID. Uh, testing is currently known as Edge and stable is currently known as Sarge. And uh, these are all characters from the uh, Pixar film Toy Story, uh, because one of the early Debian project leaders uh, was a, uh, worked on that film. Uh, so um, slightly odd names that uh, people uh, find kind of novel at first, but many people uh, know the Debian uh, distributions by that name. Uh, in fact, just earlier this year, we released Sarge uh, as our stable distribution. John, if I could add? Sure. Uh, 
You might mention that, that one of the advantages of testing is that it's supposed to enable us to more easily uh, actually do a stable release. Yes, uh, that, that, that is one of the goals, of, and that's why it's called testing. No, because well, repeated, well, I'm sure people yes. uh, one, of, uh, one of the goals of the testing distribution, why it's called testing, is that uh, by having uh, these packages which are relatively bug free, being a relatively usable uh, uh, situation, we can, ins we can uh, release a new stable distribution much faster because we already have it 90% in place and then we can just have a short period to work out the last uh, bugs from the, from the system and then release it uh, like that. Uh, because that's been one of the criticisms of Debian in, in, in the past is the long waits between stable releases. So hopefully now that we have uh, this testing framework as well, uh, we can uh, work towards making more regular and faster stable releases. Um, so then these three distributions are also duplicated uh, about 12 times in what are called ports because uh, Debian is not just for uh, PCs. Uh, Debian uh, works on all kinds of uh, computer architectures all the way from uh, you know, big IBM mainframes down to uh, um, handheld, you know, palm top type computers. And um, some people question the wisdom of that, that what's the point of having, uh, you know, a current operating system that works on, say, uh, an Amiga or, 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 or a 15 year old Macintosh or something like that. Uh, but apart from, uh, you know, the value uh, to the people doing it, just for the technical challenge of doing it, it also has a good effect that different computer architectures have slightly different ways of, uh, you know, organizing programs. So there are often subtle bugs which would not be re uh, revealed if we just did everything on PCs, but which come out when we, uh, you know, try and compile the software on these other architectures. And um, it's also very useful for our users who have, you know, old legacy equipment where the original, uh, you know, manufacturer is not really uh, doing much support or it may be out of business altogether. But, you know, you still have a working computer. So you can install Debian on it and get a, uh, you know, fairly modern uh, and, uh, a, you know, supported operating system. So, if you were to put all the software, you know, Debian, uh, Debian provides, you know, uh, you would need a whole shelf of DVDs. So that's my conclusion, is that Debian is really big. That's what you should get from, uh, you know, the last few minutes of, of what I just said. And because of that size, because of that good reputation, and because we're free, and you know we absolutely have no problems with people changing things, you know, to their liking, Debian has also become the base for other distributions. There are some people who may feel that uh, you know Debian as it is doesn't fulfill a particular task. So what they can do is they can do their own, make their own variant of Debian. Uh, which is specialized to, you know, that particular focus that they have. And um, examples of this that you may have heard of are Knopix, uh, Lindos, Progeny, Ubuntu, and Xandros, which are all, uh, you know, fairly popular and well-known uh, Linux distributions in their own right, but they're based on you know, the, the, the good foundation that Debian provides. And um, there's, there's some cooperation and back and forth between the projects as well. And, you know, there should be more, and that's one of the things that we're working on. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, a lot of these uh, distributions also, you know, contribute uh, bug fixes or, 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 or you know, um, other other technical aspects back into the base Debian, so everyone can use it. The third pillar, and probably the most important one, I would say, 
uh, given how vital the importance of computers and computing devices has become in our lives, is freedom. A freedom is a you know philosophical concept. So there are many different uh, views on you know exactly uh, you know what is meant by the term. Uh, English is very bad that way. Uh, that we have this word free, which can mean uh, um, you know even no cost or very cheap, or it can mean uh, uh, free uh, in, in 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 the sense of. Uh, with no restrictions. And other languages, and, and I think Finnish is one, are very uh, lucky that way, that they separate out these two concepts. But in English, uh, it can be a bit <coughs> confusing. So what Debian has done is codified its views on freedom in two documents. One is called the Debian Social Contract. The concept of a social contract comes from philosophers such as uh, Rousseau or Locke. Uh, um, but we've applied that to uh, computing. And based on the social contract, we have also developed the Debian free software guidelines, uh, which basically um, you know, uh, say that, well, this is our definition of freedom. And that doesn't necessarily mean that nobody else is allowed to have a different definition of freedom. But as far as the Debian project is concerned, these are the criteria that we are going to use. And I think uh, we've done uh, such a good job of it that uh, you know, the Debian free software uh, definition uh, and, and ideology has, has spread beyond into the wider free software community. In fact, uh, the open source definition, uh, which uh, uh, has influenced uh, by companies like Netscape to release uh, their browser, uh, is based on the Debian free software uh, guidelines. And the social contract, um, you can get the full, uh, full text uh, for both of these documents uh, on, the, on our website, uh, www.debian.org. And I encourage you to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to go over uh, briefly the, the most salient points covered therein. Uh, the social contract says, first of all, that Debian will remain 100% free software. So a person who uses Debian doesn't have to uh, worry that one day we will decide to you know, turn evil and start charging money and suing people and uh, getting patents on things and all the other nasty stuff that is uh, unfortunately going on in the rest of the computing industry. We are guaranteeing to you that we will remain 100% free software. And again, free software, we've also defined exactly uh, what that means. So you may agree with us or you may not, but at least at all times you'll know exactly where we stand on, on the issues of free software. The second point is that we will give back to the free software community. Debian is not just about taking software from other places and you know making it into an operating system. We also have ideas of our own uh, that we contribute back. And when we do, we're going to make sure that they're done in a way that all supporters of free software can use. We're not going to have any exclusive Debian-only features. The third point is that we will not hide problems. There are, there's been an influential essay on styles of software development called The Cathedral of the Bazaar. And uh, what that suggests is that some uh, software projects are run the way a medieval cathedral would have been built. That somebody, uh, some bishop or uh, duke or whoever decides there's going to be a cathedral and uh, you know, all the peasants uh, get pressed to work and uh, only the, the people in charge have the plans, and everyone just does as they're told, and uh, you know, uh, builds up the cathedral, and it looks very nice at the end, but you know, otherwise, uh, during the process, you don't really know much of what's going on. And the other way is like a bazaar, as you, as you still find uh, to this day in uh, India or other Asian countries, where it's just a big mess with people everywhere, 
hawking their products and uh, trying to bargain with you and there's all kinds of stuff available and much of it is junk but if you spend a lot of time and if you uh, uh, really uh, you know look closely you can find some good bargains so those are two basic styles and we're leaning more towards the bazaar in the sense that we want everything to be out in the open and again, this is not always something that makes us look good. If you read the Debian mailing lists, sometimes uh, you might think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a big bunch of children. You know, a lot of uh, fighting and flaming and all kinds of things. But the same thing goes on in uh, every software company. It's just in most cases, you don't know about it. So if you're trying to make a rational decision about uh, how, uh, you know, whether or not to use Debian or how you're going to use Debian, at least, you know, you know where you stand because it's all out in the open. And we have the bug tracking system. Uh, so if there's problems, you can, uh, you know, report them. You can see what problems have already been reported. And again, you can make your own decisions as to whether this is something that's you know appropriate for you or if you're going to look elsewhere. But at least you won't be tricked into using Debian. And the fourth point of the social contract is our priorities are our users and free software. So, you know, we're, we're just stating that up front, that we're interested in free software and we're interested in making a, a good uh, uh, operating system for our users. So, you know, this is not just a little uh, hobby uh, that some people are doing. We want something that's good and that's something that's going to be used. And the last point is we will support programs that don't meet our standards of free software. Unfortunately, not all software is free. There are commercial programs that people want to use. We don't particularly like it but we're not going to obstruct you from, uh, from using those programs. Because um, we think freedom is something that people will appreciate. It's not something that you have to you know, beat people over the head with. You just have to calmly uh, explain the benefits. And uh, you know, if, if uh, people think about it, they'll see that they're better off with uh, freedom than with slavery. So I'm just going to very quickly, as I'm running out of time now, uh, go over some of the main points of the Debian free software guidelines. The first one is that uh, it should allow, uh, a, a piece of software that is to be considered free by Debian should allow free re redistribution. Because it's no good uh, if you have uh, uh, some piece of software, if you want to give it to somebody else, but you can't, because there's some kind of artificial barrier that's stopping you. A program must include source code. Again, if you want to change, uh, you know, change the uh, Firefox web browser so that uh, um, all text is purple or something like that, you know, that might be a bizarre thing to do, but you have the right to do that. And in order to exercise that right, you need to have the code. Now, uh, the code is not always. Uh, very useful because if you're not a programmer, it, it would make no sense to you. But in that case, if you have the code, at least you can hire someone uh, to uh, make the changes that you want for you. Uh, whereas if you didn't have the source code, you'd be completely out of luck. You must allow uh, derivation, which is kind of a uh, follow on to that. If, if somebody wants to take the software that's, uh, 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 that we consider free, and change it in any way they like, they should have the right to do so. And the license of the software should not prevent that. It must not discriminate against persons or groups. Obviously, we cannot consider software free if it says that only uh, people over six foot tall are allowed to use the software or some, some you know, thing like that. So that would uh, instantly uh, make it non-free um, in our eyes. And uh, a slightly related uh, thing to that is uh, it must not discriminate against fields of endeavor. 
And that's a slightly more subtle point because there are, you know, you might think that what's wrong with a license that says uh, this program may not be used uh, for nuclear weapons testing? You know, because that's something that a lot of people think shouldn't be happening. You know, it's 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 a it's a moral uh, thing to take. Um, it's a moral stance to take, but. Um, if we allow some restrictions on freedom in that way, over time they'll just start ballooning and getting more and more uh, onerous, and they'll be more and more off them. And uh, eventually, you know, freedom will die uh, by a thousand cuts. So we consider those kinds of restrictions to be uh, against the spirit of freedom too, even if the, the uh, license's heart is in the right place, that's still not uh, really contributing to the cause of freedom. Again, freedom should be something that uh, you explain to people, not you know, just force upon them. So uh, I just want to wrap things up now and say that Debian is not just an uh, experiment in software development, but it's an experiment in a new way of social organization as well. And so as with any experiment, uh, experiments, uh, you know, mistakes get made along the way, and we're trying to fix them, then we may make more in the future, but I think we're slowly learning uh, good ways to organize, uh, you know, the development of a free operating system. And I think a lot of the lessons of Debian can also be applied to other areas. And I think there, there's a movement going on, the Creative Commons movement to extend some of the ideas of free software into the arts and into the sciences and so on. And so I'm proud as a contributor uh, to Debian to have uh, you know, been partially responsible for it. So I think Debian has a great uh, future ahead of it. And uh, I'll, won't you please be a part of it? Thank you. <laughs>